Good morning and welcome WIS community. I am Courtney Levinson, the founder of Women in Soccer. And Women in Soccer is a growing community of women and allies united by our shared love of the game. There's something also that this community shares and it's the core value that systemic racism, gender bias, and homophobia have no place in the modern game. And our community is united by this core value and is seeking to increase representation across all areas of the soccer industry for all people. And I'm here today because there are so many people in the industry that, that need spotlighting and sharing to understand the breadth of how many women are working in and around the game and the allies that make such a huge impact. Despite all of the obstacles that we face in terms of, of accessing the game and working inside the industry, we've still created this remarkable community that has this league and this incredible momentum and national team that's so inspiring and really, really driving the conversation forward. And so we are here to connect and build bridges between all of those organizations that are working in this game and to spotlight them and, so, and to connect them with talent and to really help people understand how many ways there are to work in this game. And we're excited to bring so many of the experts that have really created pathways into the game for so many. And we really want to inspire the next generation of leaders, coaches, and decision makers. So intentionally creating this platform to connect you with the different people working in the industry to inspire you to go into competing for the jobs and the opportunities that are there is why we are here today. And I am repping my goal five hoodie. And I just am so excited for all of you guys to be joining us today. You will be hearing from, from companies such as goal five, from US soccer, from different sport for development. And we want to really start it off with what brought it all here with Goal 5 and my connection with Goal 5 and Tracy Ham. And Tracy Ham and I have been on a journey through making our short documentary coach that spotlighted a lot of the obstacles we face, we are talking about today. And here's our way of kind of working in the solution. And so connecting you with these leaders in coaching and creating pathways for our young rising coaches and to understand your impact on the game matters. And I wanna see you coaching on the sidelines of the NWSL someday. And I wanna see you coaching the national team. And we need to start somewhere and here is today. So find an opportunity inside this, inside this industry and help us increase representation. And with that, I wanna turn it over to Rachel LaSala, the, uh, um, untirable machine behind putting this together for us. Take it away, Rachel. Thank you. Thanks, Courtney. You are too kind. We would not be here if it wasn't for your passion alongside all of the other incredible women that have been leading the charge for years. I'm Rachel LaSala, as Courtney just said. I'm so glad everyone can join us in a time when un when employment has been considered and appreciated in so many new ways after the year we've just had. Let's dive right in. I will be your guide through the day. Reshma Sajani of Girls Who Code shared in her recent tech talk in reference to young girls and how they learn and develop. And I think this is still really relevant for all of us today. So I wanna send us off with it. Show them, girls, that will be loved, they will be loved and accepted, not for being perfect, but being courageous. Now, I'd like to welcome Tracy Ham to the stage, the head co women's soccer coach of UC Davis, the star of the documentary coach, a women in soccer board member, an incredible role model to lead us in our first panel, advocacy for women coaching in the game. Tracy, I'll hand it to you. 
All right. Well, welcome everybody this morning. Um, it is very early on the West Coast, and so I'm very excited to be here with everybody. Um, and welcome everybody to our inaugural conference and career fair. I'm so excited. Um, I'm sure you can feel my enthusiasm as well as Courtney's that all of our hard work has um, come to fruition. And thank you for my background. Yes, this is my little pod chair. Um, so I'm very excited about this morning. Um, and I will be your moderator for uh, this first panel, as Rachel so eloquently said. Um, and so we're going to be talking to four experts in the field um, about how to be an advocate for women coaching in the game. And I think what's really interesting about this panel is everyone is coming from a very different uh, background and perspective um, and lens when looking at how to be advocates. Instead of introducing everybody um, one by one, uh, I'm going to actually let each individual kind of tell their story. Um, through three different kind of questions, and I call these the three P's. Um, and so we can start with Nicole, if that's okay, if Nicole's on here. Um, and the three P's that each, uh, each panelist will cover is, what is your passion, what is your purpose, and what is your path? Um, and I think it will give everybody a glimpse at how they got into their current role what um, what is driving them and their success, and then what path did it take to get there, um, or what path are they going to take um, to continue being advocates uh, to women coaching in the game? So let's start. Um, JT, can we like start with you? Are you on? Uh, good morning, Tracy. It is early here on the West Coast. And um, good morning to everybody uh, at the conference. Glad everybody could come in this morning. So um, the three Ps, uh, Tracy likes letters. Um, I thought a lot about this since the little chat that we had. Um, and I think there's a lot of different answers that would fit into any of these categories, but to, to, to be as concise as possible. Uh, my purpose, um, I, I see it as a, a, an educator and a mentor. Um, I, I see the game as a conduit to help the young women that I coach um, be become the best versions of themselves. But it's also now that I've been doing it for about 5000 years. Um, it's morphed into continuing that development after they leave the, the, the playing ranks of the teams that I have worked with. Uh, yesterday afternoon, we had a, a playoff game down in the South Bay, and uh, there were about a dozen alumni who turned up from various different classes. Um, and it was great to catch up with them. Uh, a couple of them have started coaching themselves, and uh, that gave me a sense of fulfillment about the purpose because. Uh, I get to watch them as they matriculate through college and then into their professional lives. Uh, and some of them stay with the game and and kind of pay back uh, the stuff that they got from the game. So I would say that that, that overall, that's my purpose. Um, my passion is is directly connected to that. I, I love seeing growth. Um, to 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 see a young woman at age fourteen or fifteen come into a high school program. Uh, and then watch over the years as as she adds more and more life experiences uh, uh, into her tapestry um, and to see where they end up. You know, I've been coaching women's soccer now long enough that I have I have former players in their mid 40s who have uh, kids of their own that are nearly old enough for me to be coaching. Um, and that that really energizes me that that. Uh, seeing that growth and that development is awesome. And the pathway, um, I could tell super long stories, but I literally fell into this after starting uh, to coach out of college for about three years with uh, uh, young boys in San Francisco, um, literally fell into coaching women's soccer um, as a fill-in for a friend. And I thought it was going to be about 
two or three week gig until <laughs> that got sorted out. That was uh, 30 something years ago um, and, and have never really looked back. But the pathway also includes a lot of education, both formal in terms of coaching uh, education and, and earning and badges and licenses and attending clinics, but really more importantly, um, learning about the women's game, learning about women's issues, um, coming to grips uh, with the realization that my level of empathy as a male coach uh, won't come naturally because my experiences aren't the same. So, uh, doing a lot of reading, uh, doing a lot of research, but really, probably most importantly, uh, talking with and listening to um, female players and and taking their stories on board uh, to help raise my level of understanding of uh, what it's like to be a, a female player and then a female coach uh, in a in still a male dominated game. So uh, those are my three P's. JT. Um love that positivity and i think uh when we had talked last week um kind of preparing for this i think my takeaway from listening to you speak was um you know that things can change and the way things that you know the way that they've been they don't have to stay that way um and so kind of having that growth mindset um and that and knowing and understanding that the game can evolve um, and challenging men and other advocates to continue pushing and promoting change and development and supporting female coaches is, is really key to um, continuing to enhance our visibility and the opportunities that we have in this field, in this industry. So thank you very much for sharing. Um, next, let's hop over to Lynn. Um, she is incredible, um, and I was so excited to well meet you in person, I guess, um, via Zoom uh, last week. I was like, finally, this like woman <laughs> that I've been hearing about and knowing about forever, I get to see in person. So, um, Lynn, why don't you start us off with your three Ps, your passion, your purpose, and your path? Oh, and Tracy, it's very nice to meet you. And it's funny that, you know, we're both from Northern California and we had to travel miles to actually get to, to see each other and do it via Zoom. But um, let's see, my passion, um, uh, you know, soccer is clearly my passion. I've been in it for mo all of my career, really, from the very beginning. I started as a soccer, I'm going to probably mesh these together a little bit, but I started as a soccer journalist and um, it's an interesting it's an interesting history only in the sense that when I got into the game and I refused to actually give my age, my date of birth, any of those sorts of things, we'll just do it contextually. When I got into the game, there really weren't very, almost any other women. Um, I am now CEO of an organization called United Soccer Coaches. It was, re before that it was called the National Soccer Coaches Association of America. And when I went to my first convention, um, again, and I went as a reporter, I was literally the only woman in the building who was not a wife and a wife of, a, of, a, of an attending coach. And um, the great part of that, actually, I won't say a great part of it, but a part of that was actually I was very I was welcomed very warmly at that point. It has not always been a warm welcome to be a woman in soccer by any means. But my passion is actually seeing people move forward. It's to see the game move forward. And quite frankly, in this context, it's really to see the growth and development of women within the game, but quite frankly, also what the women have brought to the game. The game is better because of the diversity, because of the women that have gotten involved in it. Um, you know, my purpose is, um, you know, I'm a business person now, and I've been a business person for a long time. And soccer is my business, and I've been in it from the media perspective, I've been in it from an organizational perspective, I was chief marketing officer for a large youth soccer organization at one time. So I have quite a variety of background, but it always came back to try to bring the game to more people in the U.S. and to, to make it not a gimmick, to make it a serious, and when I say serious, not serious in the sense of, um, uh, I'm trying to think of a better word than serious, but oftentimes we were always sort of the outlier. Soccer was the outlier. If you played soccer, you were an outlier. You had to find your tribe because it wasn't easy to find it. And I think if there's anything that's really transformed over the last 40 years, 
is that our tribe is all around us now, and that did not used to be the case. And as I, you know, in terms of my path, um, and I, I take a lot of pride in the number of women who have crossed my path over my career that I have either helped bring in and up through the game, or conversely, who have helped me. Um, uh, for, for many, the game still feels rather new. It is, it is not. Um, and women in the game have, frankly, done much of the legwork of the development of our sport at every level. And I think it's one of the things I'm very proud of. Um, the collection of friends and, um, and contacts that I have today who are women my age or similarly is, um, is, is large. So we've been around for a long time and we're just happy to see a, the evolution of these new young women coming up and, and, and claiming it as their own without even thinking about it. We fought to claim it. Um, now you get to just claim it as your own and it's almost a birthright. We're really glad to see that, frankly. So that's me. Great, thank you so much, Lynn. Uh, I'm so excited also for our next speaker. Uh, Nicole Hercules is just like this energetic. Every time I hear you talk, I'm like, yes, girl, like bring me the positivity. All right, so I will let Nicole tell her story. Uh, what is your passion? What is your purpose? And how did you get there? And where are you going? Where are you taking us? Yeah, well, first, I just want to thank Women in Soccer and, of course, you, Tracy, for putting together such a great organization that I see such beautiful diversity at. I, every time I'm looking at what you guys are doing, I'm like, yes, you're advocating and you're advocating for everyone. It's a great, diverse population. So thank you for what you guys are doing. Um, and, of course, Lynn, I got to shout you out. I did soccer coaches and uh, JT it was wonderful hearing your story. Um, but for me, you know, it started just loving this game. My passion is this game and people. Um, finding ways to transform people's lives using this game. And I always start with this story because it's really important and it, it really speaks to why. Um, but when I was still in college, you know, I had a, a inner city youth coach who came to me and he said, Nicole, I really want you to work with this inner city group of kids. I didn't know how to coach at that time. So I'm, I, to dribble when I was in college. So that's all I knew how to teach. So I'm teaching this group, you know, how to you know, build their skill set. And I had to make them buy into it. So I gave them two, two minutes to take the ball off my foot and they couldn't. So at the end of this conversation that I had with these kids, one little girl looked at me and she said, where are you from? And that bothered me thoroughly because she said that because she didn't believe that black people could play soccer in this country. So she assumed that I was from Canada, Africa, or the because in her mind, you, you have to be, you couldn't be in America and play this, it just wasn't for you. So for me, when it came to this game and it came to after the time I graduated, after I, I finished playing this game, it was really important for me to find a balance where I was able to create opportunities for underserved communities, especially for people of color who thought for some reason that this game wasn't for them or anything wasn't for them. So the passion and the path is really to create opportunities for kids to have everything that they need to thrive in the sport. And it's also for representation. So that little girl would always know that she can see people out there who are doing this game, who are playing this game at all levels. That was what was really important for me. And that's the path that we're looking to create moving forward. Wow. That was awesome. Very succinct. Um, great. Well, I, I love actually, I know, um, Lynn, you told us um, what your current role is. Uh, Nicole, will you kind of talk to... Um, you know, the audience about where you're, where you're at and some of the different things that you're involved in? Absolutely. Um, so advocacy for me is really important. I'm actually the first female chair of the Black Soccer Coaches Association with Lynn at United Soccer Coaches. So I'm always very appreciative of Lynn because she created that dynamic for the Advocacy Council to exist uh, years ago with Lincoln Phillips when Black coaches needed a, a platform and a place to be seen and heard. Um, Lynn allowed that to happen. So I'm always very grateful to Lynn for that. Um, but I also have a league um, in the city of Rochester that's called the, the Rochester City Soccer League. And it's a soccer league that it's a holistic soccer league that creates not only just a place for kids to play for free, um, but we have academic support, college advisement, career development. Um, so it's really about the partnerships and the relationships that we have with our community. Um, we have kids who are thriving. We have kids who are valedictorians every year. So it's really about giving kids an opportunity to not only fall in love with this game, but for us to nurture what their next moves will be, whether it's in college or whatever they love to do. We're just making sure that we're creating an environment that they have everything that they need.
And then I also have an, a national company called NMH Consulting, where we do inner city clinics across the country, uh, creating opportunities for kids who wouldn't otherwise be able to play the game. So making sure that we're advocating for kids who need opportunities on the field and off the field. It's like really important work and very inspiring, uh, Nicole. It's so awesome. Um, I feel like so much of what we do, you have to be just so proact uh, proactive and not even get creative, but just like be willing to hear no or I don't have time or, you know, all of the different obstacles that we face um, and then just like take it in stride and keep going and, and get your message across and um, just create these amazing opportunities for, for everyone. So um, what I think is really interesting, and, and Lynn, I didn't know this about you. Um, so Lynn, Lynn told our panel uh, last week that she had actually never coached. Um, but she's the she's the the head honcho of like the biggest coaching organization in the country, um, and I I felt like really I actually kind of got goosebumps from it because I was like here's this amazing woman who kind of has like no skin in the game in some ways um, that's just literally an advocate like with like just a like pure heart advocate for for coaches in general and I think that you know obviously you're perfect for this panel um, but. You said something to me that was, um, well, not to me, but to everybody um, that I thought was really important. And you said, coaches forget that they are labor. And to me, um, I that like kind of like hit me because I was like labor. I'm like, for whatever reason, that had like a negative like connotation with me. But then I was like, no, this is amazing because you had said, you're like, no, they they're like, forgotten people and they're expendable and they're voiceless and your presence has you know in, in your path you've done all these different things to make sure that we do have a voice and that there is recognition that coaches are important um and that we do have value um and i was wondering if you could just talk a little bit more um about sure. kind of what you meant by that sure um you know and i, I don't know that i recognized it to the degree that I feel feel it today until I joined United Soccer Coaches. Um, I wasn't a coach. I wasn't a player. Um, I came up in soccer as a business and I come from a soccer family. So I, I have real roots in there and I knew a lot, but I, as much as anything, I was a fan. Um, but soccer has been my career and my business. And the thing that's interesting, I, I think, from my perspective is, you know, again, I I'm not a coach. So why was I hired as the head of a coaches association? Because I'm a very good soccer business person. And in many ways, that was the, um, or I, I won't say very good, very experienced. How about that? That's probably a better qualifier. And the reality I found was that coaches as a group feel they're just lucky to have a job. And, and certainly I don't want to diminish that in any way. We all sometimes just feel lucky to have a job. But I think the reality is, and, I've, and I have great concerns about it for our sport, is that we see too often that I uh, listen to young coaches saying, all I want to do is coach. But the reality is that your opportunities are bigger and wider the more experiences you have, the more you do, the more things you know. A uh, very small example of that is that um, United Soccer Coaches, for example, has a, um, uh, a partnership with um, um, a, a local uh, university's business school to support an MBA program. And it's not a soccer, it's not soccer specific. It's an MBA program that we give $2,000 scholarships to college, uh, to, excuse me, to soccer coaches to be able to get that MBA. And the reason for it with all of this is simply that um, it's important in, in some ways, each coach, and this always makes people very sensitive, are sort of a small business. Um, if you're a musician and you do it as a job and as a career, you're also kind of a small business. You do books, you pay taxes, you hire people, you promote yourself, you do all of these things. And when I say that they're labor, um, oftentimes we find that, and the pandemic really spotlighted it. All of a sudden coaches were out of a job in a heartbeat. They had no health coverage and they often had no health coverage to begin with. And, or they had, you know, really hadn't thought about the future. and. Um, it, it, I don't want to diminish how valuable and important all the organizations are that, that hire coaches, but I also want coaches to think of themselves as professionals. And um, we, call, we talk about labor, we're not a union. 
We are a professional association or a trade association. But our job, from my perspective, is to help coaches come into their own, um, to understand their value, to escalate their value. Um, and oftentimes, that's not the X's and O's. That's can you speak well in front of a crowd? That's can you, you know, can you hire and fire well? A lot of things that folks on this group, on this program today, know well that they probably never learn on a field. There's lots to learn. And I, I'm, you know, again, in my role, I'm a good example. I am surrounded by great coaches who have great knowledge, and I draw upon that every day. But running of an association business is, is, is very similar, regardless of what the industry is. Um, we as an association have, and it's, you may or may not be aware, or our folks may or may not be aware, we changed our name um, four years ago. And it was really in some ways to better tell our story. We're an enormously powerful education organization, but advocacy and uniting coaches together into a powerful force is another extraordinarily important and unique thing that we do. Um, Nicole is the chair of our, um, our black coaches group, but we have 11 groups that are represented on our advocacy council. We have black coaches, Latino coaches, our women's group, our women's coaches group is the oldest, by far the best organized in many ways, simply because they've been around for over 25 years. But we also have Native American, um, we have Asian American Pacific Islander, we have disability, we have a faith-based group that is multi, multi-faith. Um, coaches come in all colors and stripes, and we wanna make sure that they are advocated for within our organization, so we provide good services, but we also want to advocate for them externally. And uh, for example, Nicole's group is working with our marketing staff and communication staff to put together a whole day program on Juneteenth this year that is specifically targeted towards coaches, obviously, but is focusing on one of the groups that we think is incredibly important. So um, I know that's a, a kind of a rambling answer here, but I think that the, the point is really, um, coaches do a ton of stuff for free, and I'm good with that. We all are happy to volunteer, but I think it's extremely important that coaches also recognize their value. They know how to negotiate a contract, even at a club level, that they recognize that um, uh, if they are not watching out for their own career and their own welfare, probably nobody else is doing it for them. And those are skills you have to learn. And um, our, my greatest fear, it, it's one thing to be 20 or 25, and uh, have coached two or three teams and do personal training and camps during the summer and you kind of make cobble together a living and you live in your mom's basement and you're kind of good. Um, at 35, that's, that's a tougher road to hoe. And at 45, you're done. There's not gonna be a lot of future for you out of that. So if you haven't begun to build that career in a very thoughtful way, um, it, it may go by and you may not get the career you want. So from that point, I see it as labor and I think it's really important. And again, this is not to push aside that we're all about the kids and we're about soccer at its core and all of those things. But in my role as United Soccer Coaches, I feel my job is to advocate for coaches in their entirety. And that means how you pay your bills every month and you know, do you have a 401k and all those sorts of things for the future as well. Thank you so much. Um, yes, I feel all of that. Um, I think, you know, I, I'll give you my very short kind of synopsis of my passion, purpose, and path. And, and Lynn, you kind of did a great segue for me. Um, because I think for me, my passion um, really was just like coaching and leading women. Um, and soccer for me has been like the kind of the medium to do that. Um, so I've really used coaching and soccer as like a mechanism and a tool to grow um, and like learn confidence because I think there's so many translatable skills um, mm -hmm. that you learn on the field that, you know, translate to being off the field. I think confidence is probably one of the most important ones. Um, you know, even as a coach, sometimes we break you down <laughs> confidence um, in some ways, but it's that that ability to respond to failure and its ability to respond to challenge and be better for it. Um, and I think, you know, hearing kind of the the journey, like you said, what does your career look like at 25, 35, 45? Um, advocating for yourself is really important, but also surrounding yourself with a network um, of people and 
you know, potentially former players and former coaches uh, like JT is a, is a current coach of mine, a former coach of mine, and he's been an incredible advocate for me um, and resource to bounce ideas off of. And building that network is really, really important. Um, but I think that, again, is, is related to kind of what my purpose is. Um, like you said, is can, can coaching for not just women, but coaching in general, be seen as a viable career and something that's not just like a side hustle. Um, Cause I think that that's typically how coaching careers can start um, is you're like, well, I, I played and, you know, I'm, you know, bartending and I'm, you know, working as an intern here and then I'm coaching club in the evenings and that's how I'm piecing together my, you know, paying my bills. <laughs> um, and, you know, like I tell people this, like I, I didn't go to UC Berkeley to be a soccer coach, right? Like I went to play at a really high level, but I went to, you know, be an investment banker or, you know, be a CEO at Google, like a lot of my friends, you know, <laughs> here I am coaching soccer. Um, and, you know, for me, I was always passionate about, about the game and, and being a coach because it was something that I was just drawn to of being part of a team and, and leading women. Um, you know, but when you're young, you're looking back and you're kind of comparing yourself. Well, I'm like, I'm just coaching. Um, you know, when I'm looking at my friends that are working for Fortune 500 companies and, you know, not that I was necessarily, you know, thinking that I, I wasn't on the right track, but I never looked at coaching in my 20s as being what I was going to do because it wasn't and still isn't in a lot of ways for a lot of people a viable path and career. Um, and that's what my I guess new purposes is, is, you know, joining all of you and helping um, women, you know, have an opportunity to only coach and it's okay to only coach because it's awesome and it's an amazing career. And I've had a lot of opportunities to do other things and I just keep coming back to coaching because that's, it's what I love. Um, but you do have to have so much passion and a lot of grit and kind of thick skin to stick with it because there's a lot of no's and there's not a lot of opportunity for women. Um, and it's not necessarily an inviting space. And so that's what my new kind of path is, is obviously winning championships and competing and coaching and doing those things that I love, but using the game, um, or I guess continuing to use the game to provide opportunity for women to to stay in the game, maybe not even as coaches, but to feel that sense of pride um, of working within the game in some capacity. Um, and it doesn't have to be something full-time, but just loving what you're doing and, and continuing to give back and growing the game and making it bigger. So um, yeah, thank, thank you, Lynn and, and Nicole. And uh, JT, um, I wanted to loop you back into this. Um, just kind of hearing what, you know, uh, Nicole and Lynn and I have talked about um, you know, I, unfortunately, you know, I don't think that there are a ton of male advocates in a lot of ways. Um, I think that there's sometimes where like men are threatened or they feel like women are only getting jobs because they're women. Now, um, that's kind of the new thought is, oh, well, a, a female is going to get that job. And it's like, OK, it's like it's said with this air of like, well, it's only because of this. Um, can you just kind of speak? And then I Everett had a question in the um, in the chat about, you know, is there any specific like reading material that you found maybe helpful or that you would recommend? And maybe it's in relation to my last question. I'll start with the I'll start with Everett's question, which I, I answered in the chat. But Everett asked a question about what have I read? I could do a two day seminar on Hero. What I've read. <laughs> But I, I literally uh, typed out to him um, the first book that I ever got on women's issues in sport called Out of the Bleachers. It was actually published in 1979. Um, the full title is Out of the Bleachers, Writings in Women and Sports by uh, Stephanie Twin. The reason I put that on there is that I think it's a great jumping off point for anyone to get context on on the struggle that women have had in in being taken seriously in athletics, uh, not just soccer. Um, and it also spans uh, a pretty wide swath. It's not just uh, from coaching, but as participants, uh, as journalists. Uh, I'm sure Lynn <laughs> has more than a couple stories uh, during her career 
of, uh, you know, like you said, being the only uh, woman in the room, uh, being the only female journalist in the room, I would imagine at times, uh, and mm -hmm. and sort of, you know, the, the some of the male writers kind of looking askance. Would be a great place to start for anyone, uh, including uh, our, our female coaches and participants this morning, because I think it's also important. You know, Trace, we talked at the, uh, last week about the, the fact that I've been doing this long enough now that the players I have now, when you say Title IX to them, they don't, any, I, they think it's a hashtag. Um, I think it's important when we talk about education that um, we encourage women to contextualize the experience they're having right now too. Because, um, you know, there are a, a, a solidly a generation of women who have been beneficiaries of what Title IX uh, opened up that don't really understand where that came from. And I think it's important. I think it's important that they understand uh, how the opportunities that they have were earned, what those opportunities look like, and to really understand that those opportunities are not God-guaranteed not to take them for granted, uh, to understand that that the, the the their moms and their aunts and their older sisters that came before them had to do a lot uh, to sort of push back against the the dominant paradigm in the society, um, because I think that as soon as you start to take for granted uh, the things that you have and not understand how they were earned, um, it's very easy for some of these things that you just brought up to start creeping back into it. Well, because uh, they're trying to hire more women right now, right? Those tropes that you're beginning to hear more and more of, uh, which for a while sort of recessed, they're, they're definitely creeping back in. And I think it's, it's the job of everyone to, to recognize that, to push back against it, uh, but to do it from a position of, of understanding where those things are coming from. You mentioned, uh, you know, uh, fear, jealousy. Um, I think it's important, you know, Lynn, Lynn talked about the fact that this is a job. Um, you know, it's a vocation. It takes uh, a lot of hard work to be halfway decent at it. But it's mm -hmm. also the way that people pay for their Range Rovers and their condominiums. And uh, for a long time, male coaches only needed to compete with half of the gender pool. Right. So now they have to compete with essentially twice as many people going for jobs and, it, you know, elbows are getting sharp. People will do what they need to do to ensure that, that they keep their position on the pyramid, whether it's earned or merited. Um, and I, something that needs to be recognized as well. And then for, for the, some of the male colleagues on the call this morning. I feel that we have a responsibility to push back against that, to make what we do um, a meritocracy, mm -hmm. to, to really try to create a space where the people who deserve the positions, whether they're a head coach, assistant coach, director of coaching in a club, uh, an athletic director at a, at a school, uh, you know, a, a, a CEO or a, a, a senior mm -hmm. Uh, VP at a company, those positions need to be earned. They should go to the best people. And if the best mm -hmm. person in, yes. in that particular position is a female, so be it. Thank you for that. Um, we have like two minutes left, I think. So if we want to go through very quickly, um, I think it's really important to leave with something like actionable. And this might be like one sentence from Nicole Lynn, and JT. Um, but what, what would be one takeaway or one actionable item that you could give to not even the coaches on the call, but just the advocates, everybody on the call? Let's start with Nicole. I'm going to put you on the spot. <laughs> yeah, for me, when we're what we're talking about is important, but I think it's also to 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 mention the intersections that often are even more isolated from from their voices being heard. Um, so I say, look at your table. Everyone has their own, you know, tribe, your own place which, where you're working, um, and see who's missing. Look at the miss the missing uh, voices, the the missing 
that in, in differences um, and make sure that you're filling your table or creating an opportunity from coaches who you may not understand their perspective. It's one of the best things about the advocacy council that we have is that there you can see multiple people from different backgrounds and just hear different perspectives. So I think it's important that we include race and ethnicity in that. Great, thanks, Nicole. Lynn, what do you got for us? You know, I, we're, I, I think it's start where you are is, is one of the critical things I think that Nicole said. And I think that's absolutely true is no matter what your situation is, no matter where you are, no matter what your job is, is there's, there's, a, there's a one step you can take today that will both drive advocacy. Don't ever be a side, you know, silence is complicity. Never be silent. Um, you just can't. And um, I, I will tell you that sometimes there's a price to be paid for being the, the loud one. Um, hopefully in the long run, it, it, you, you get something for it, I, I'll say, but I was often the loud one and that holds you back sometimes, but in the big picture, you always get ahead. So start where you are, say what you mean. Um, and, and, I, and I think that that's an advocate, not just for yourself, but it becomes an advocate for, for all. That's great. It's really, really good. Uh, JT. Um, again, there's a ton of things, but the one thing, if you're a coach, male or female right now, um, pick a player that's, that's you've had and, and encourage her, uh, to follow up and keep, uh, chasing the coaching path, uh, put her name out to people. When you hear about job openings, pester her to go continue to get licensing, make her go to Wales and get a UEFA, um, uh, do whatever you can practically um, to, to keep pushing more qualified, motivated, bright young women into the game to, so that the, that space gets bigger and bigger and it just kind of creates a vortex and sucks more of them in. Mm -hmm. I think that that's great advice because I, I think that that's probably my biggest takeaway and, and something that I'd want to leave um, the audience with is is role model. Um, I think that, you know, and this isn't me, you know, this, with the, I say this with the most humility, role, role model what you want your players to be. And if they if you want them to be a coach, be a good coach, be someone that they aspire to be to. Um, and I think that that's like the, a lot of the players that I've coached, they've gotten into coaching. Um, and I'm not going to say that's 100% because of me, because uh, they are, you know, adult women that are making their own decisions. But I certainly would like to think that I've had an impact on them. And I've shown that this is a fun job. It's a rewarding job. It's incredibly um, inspiring on a day to day basis, you get to around people like motivate people every single day. Um, and that's, you know, as selfish as it is, like I, I get my energy from them, you know, as well. So it's a, it's a great relationship and building that rapport, um, with people and, and continuing to build relationships, um, you know, and, and show, show your players that, um, it's, it's an amazing thing to be a coach. Um, and then hopefully it's something that they feel the same way having you and they want to give back and they want that role for themselves because um, you've provided such a great platform for what it means to be a coach. So that's my, um, that's my mm -hmm. actionable item. You know, um, I do want to, we have like, well, we have a couple more minutes. Can um, I add one more thing, Tracy? Yeah, absolutely. One real quick thing. It, it is a commercial, but, but a very, very short <laughs> one is that if you are a coach today in this country, and you don't belong to your coaches association, what you are missing is just crazy. So, um, you know, I, and I know everyone on this call is, or any, everyone in this group is, is already active and involved, but that's where your tribe lives and it is a wonderful opportunity. So you should really go to unitedsoccercoaches.org and, and check out what is there for you. Tracy, can I add something to yeah, Absolutely. Yeah, we're in a really important state right now. The youth, coming up they're different it's not that they're, they're these kids are they're empowered they're speaking they're using their voices they are unafraid um so we have a really unique opportunity right now as coaches as leaders to make sure that we're empowering the youth that we have because i'll tell you what i see some of my high school kids and they're coming through and what we have to do is create a platform for them and that's out of their way 
they're ready, guys. They're ready for to become leaders. They're ready to inspire this next generation. And we just got to do our best to make sure that we're supporting them and allowing them to be the best essence mm -hmm. of themselves that they can be. That's great, Nicole. Um, so there's a couple of questions in the chat. Um, we will, or in the Q and A, um, since we're kind of, you know, running out of time, um, I, we have our, our breakout sessions. Um, I, I'm not sure if Lynn and Nicole are on mm -hmm. there. What times are your breakout sessions? Oh, no, I'm not. I'm just, not, I'm just, Nicole. I'm just dipping You're in. You're just here. All right. Yeah. I love it. Great. Well, I'm happy. Um, mine is at 7:45. Well, actually 10 45. Um, so I'm happy to talk through Courtney's uh, question about licensed and qualified females and why they're not necessarily in the NWSL. Um, increasing pay for coaching staffs. There's some really, really great questions um, and I'm happy to kind of discuss those more at length in one of our breakout sessions. Um, but I just want to say thank you so much to JT and Nicole and Lynn. Uh, I think that there's some really, really great information that was shared, some great feedback, um, some wonderful, like actionable items. And a lot of it's just like living and breathing, um, you know, what, what this game means and what it's, what it's been and what it's meant to our careers and mm -hmm. our relationships and networks that we've been able to build um, so far. So uh, thank you women in soccer for uh, creating this career fair and the first of many, hopefully. Um, but yeah, everyone have a great day and enjoy this. Um, it's so cool to be a part of it. And thank you. Glad I woke up for this. Um, <laughs> now actually I've off to practice. So good way to start my day also. So thank you everybody so much um, and enjoy your day. And thanks, thanks Tracy. Tracy. Thank you so much, JT, Tracy, Lynn, Nicole. It is such a pleasure to start the day with all some of the incredible takeaways from JT, pick up a player, encourage her to follow a pathway into coaching. Lynn, her passions in the game and business is pivotal in order to have that game continue to thrive. Don't stay silent and be complicit. Nicole, Again, passion is the game and the people. After being asked, where are you from? Because it's not often black people are seen as people that play soccer. She's empowered to see, have every child see the way they can thrive inside the sport. So look at your table and see who's missing. And then Tracy, growing and leading women, build confidence in women and, and be able to them respond better to failure. Oh, the takeaways could go for forever. But thank you so much to all of you for being here. I will ask you now to turn off your cameras and your microphones so we move you off stage and we bring in our next fantastic expert, Chanel. We see with New Mexico United will be leading our first workshop of the day, creating a diversity fellowship program. She comes to us from, as the executive director of the Somos Unidos Foundation, but I will let her do some more introduction to herself. Good morning, Chanel. Please take it Good away. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much, Rachel. Um, and I caught the tail end of what we were just presenting on. And it, I think it's a perfect segue into, you know, those of you in positions now who are able to actually put structure into place on how we can officially bring more people into the game, more women into the game, more people of color into the game. So this presentation I'm about to give is just the way that New Mexico United and the Somos Unidos Foundation chose to um, pursue that. And some of it is very specific to what resources we had at the time, you know, our league's ability to embrace that and actually to hope that um, it actually becomes more of a standard across clubs in our league. So obviously it has the club perspective too. There are some of us on this call that aren't in necessarily a specific club, but I think the tenets of what we're trying to do are, are good to try to replicate in whatever way makes sense for you. So what I'm hoping comes of the presentation is um, really showing how we decided to just get moving and, and do it imperfectly instead of um, later, right, when we could figure everything out. So in a way, just the New Mexico United way is also to build the plane as we're flying it <laughs> in general. Um, a little bit about me and the organization first, and this is going to be a good indicator as well, is that I just started with New Mexico United in April of 2020. And so in January of 2020 is when I started talking to our owner and CEO about 
um, even the idea of moving forward in like this philanthropic organization capacity of starting a 501c3 and doing a nonprofit arm of the club. So what we didn't know in January is that COVID was going to, you know, hit the United States and our season was going to be temporarily canceled and all of that. So um, I bring that up because I think choosing to embark on a diversity fellowship program with the uncertainty of the season is something that is actually part of like the ethos and what I'm hoping the fellows themselves in the community adjacent to the program actually gets from it as well, is that what's most important is, is to get moving. And I love what Courtney said, get moving imperfectly. So I put um, some information together on a PowerPoint. I'm gonna kind of breeze through some of the heavy text, but I wanted to put all of the elements that we actually put out publicly because you know, I'm happy to share this presentation with whoever and, and I really wanted everyone to have like the actual outline of, of the way we approach this. So I'm gonna share my screen really quick. Da, da, da. All right. Can someone give me a verbal that you can see the entire presentation? I don't know if that's possible. Rach? We're good. Okay, cool, thank you. So um, this is building a diversity fellowship program and our approach and some lessons learned um, through this year. So we actually came up with the initial concept in June of 2020. And then when we actually put out applications it was closer to like August and September. And then we started the program this February. So I don't think anybody on this call needs to know the why, but just as a reminder, and this is something that we put out when we were launching the program to just the disparate um, representation um, between women and people of color. And like putting this stuff out there for us as well, like it does have something about the NWSL there just to show that like the presidents and coaches, even in a league that we all look to as a beacon of inclusivity, that there's still progress to be made. And what these numbers showed us too, is that this was work worth doing. So if we're bringing people through a coaching fellowship and they can go be a coach in the NWSL, that's like the perfect outcome for us. And while we're looking in a way at our own little corner of the world, and we've been really lucky in our front office to have been able to assemble a diverse team like we really did struggle in the beginning of like, is it appropriate to be looking at things globally? Because shouldn't we just be looking at what we can immediately address? But um, that didn't change the fact that like, we don't have any women head coaches with New Mexico United either. So we wanted to put this out there as a reminder to the general public and the fans who appreciate our community work, but don't necessarily follow us for our community work to remind um, why we were taking the action that we did. And then like the goals I think are pretty clear, but we wanted to increase diversity and leadership roles in our sport and in athletics in general. And then for the educational advancement piece, recognizing that the financial barriers um, and you know, being in a pipeline, if, if you haven't already started in that pipeline, it can be really challenging to decide to make a pivot. So um, this is actually something that I, I can thank uh, an incredible ally for women in our organization, who's our head coach, Troy Lassane. A lot of this program was developed through his empathetic understanding of his approach to trying to get his pro license and realizing how much he was leaning on his wife and his family at the time. And um, the fact that he was empowered through New Mexico United to pursue that, right? So like given the flexibility from his current position, that was something that New Mexico United actually wanted him to do. Plus also being a white male, he looked at all of those things, recognizing like I'm still struggling with approaching this pro license and I have every reason in the world why it shouldn't be this hard for me. And so that is something I just wanted to highlight too, for anybody on this call who is in any sort of position of advocacy, which I think we all are, even in our own circles, to our own family and friends, something on Troy Lassane's path, like opened him up to have that empathetic view. And it I don't think it comes as any like coincidence that this actually 
um, revelation about how he was empowered to take this on and other people may not be was happening in June of 2020. So I also just want to pause and give note to all of us who might have felt like we were sharing things into the void or speaking to people who weren't hearing us like there are white men in our networks that are being changed like hearts and minds and that are using their influence to pass things on i think because of of everyone's um, persistence in telling that story so um these are the goals i think it's pretty self-explanatory and i'm going to move forward into more of the nuts and bolts of what we put out into the public for what we were looking for because there are a couple of things there that i think really um just put an exclamation point on exactly what we're trying to uh, pursue in imagining the profile of the person who was coming in so this is what we put out for just like a what to expect um, the front office fellowship is three months and we're looking to you know have them have a curriculum that's diverse in terms of just one-on-one -on -one education hands-on learning classroom style learning and working a game day because for us just in the front office we know like the sigh of the relief when in any capacity we're about to interview somebody for a job and we see that they have even like worked a game day or have worked in an um in a front office or in an athletics organization before not that we don't believe people can learn but it's one less thing that we have to explain and that's a huge part of inequity too is um even us trying to be aware of it we still value that experience which is fair and we want to try to give that experience to people who are trying to pivot into athletics or pivot into sports or soccer specifically because if they've only been working um in like bank telling or something like that needs of having to do our jobs and bring somebody else along with us so this is just a little overview um, we really wanted to give candidates a holistic perspective of the kind of things that they would learn with New Mexico United for anybody that follows us I, I'm sure you can imagine um, when we hire for different positions we get a lot of people talking about marketing and what we put out in terms of design and graphics and that's really great but we wanted to like really embed that into a holistic um rundown of what a front office is because we do get a lot of people who are willing to work the retail floor because they're hoping to have you know a step into the marketing department which is a great problem to have but it's just something that we're aware of and, and we like to lead with um showing the entire operation of a front office and then we're this is one of those things that's very specific to new mexico united we have somebody on staff who used to be in collegiate advising and who is actually certified in career coaching and development so um that's something that we can totally lean on that we don't have to pay extra for and that has been a true blessing just because it's it feels like it adds some value to the program um because again a new mexico united problem that we're very lucky to have is some people just love us and just want to be part of whatever we're doing so we want to make best use of that time for the people who are like i don't even know if i want to work in sports but i know i want to be a part of this program um and i want to grow through it and then the the one thing that is like a non-negotiable for us that if we didn't have you know the ability to find the funding we wouldn't do it is is that the whole point is that at the end of the fellowship um the fellows receive a stipend to take the next step so that's our investment back into the into the fellow as an individual and um like really hoping to follow their journey and see what they decide to do after that um the stipend plays a larger role in the conversation with the coaching candidates because I mean, that's they can literally take those funds and apply them to a direct next step in licensure, which is a huge barrier for many. So um, that that's kind of what we put out for the front office. And then this is the what I believe to be the limited qualifications, and that was really intentional. Um, they have to fit the elements of the diversity of the program. At this time, we determined that they needed to be at least 21 years of age, but we're 
considering like if we can get through this program we have fellows with us right now that we either develop a separate program or lower that to 18 but either way we're also interested in doing a summer program for um people that are in high school to get them thinking about the sports industry and things like that so having a passion for knowledge of new mexico united just so that they can hit the ground running and just committing some sort of hours to scheduled learning. And we wanted to be really flexible about that. You can see the note here about inclusive accommodation because we expect that the program was to be in addition to whatever, you know, the current situation for the fellows is to make a living. We never intended for this to be something that could substitute um, a job like an internship might normally do. Um, and we're also intentional about what we ask the fellows to do that help us. That's something that I remind the staff of very often is that we nothing about having fellows in our midst should be um, easier for us. It should also it should always be something that has us do additional work for them, giving additional value back to them. Um, we've been lucky that our COVID constraints have allowed us to be in person, um, but it's totally a program that could be conducted virtual if, you know, things were to ever change or if there's something that you're looking at doing like with your organization and you want to open it up to people that are not in your actual physical location. And then this is just what we wanted to show for what highly competitive applicants will, will do. Um, and we wanted to make a note too that like we because because we could not come to a consensus among a group of us of what the educational accomplishments should mean um there are some people who are more traditional in our organization that really value education and, and education is is a mark of our ethos hard work diligence and humility and, and it's something we want everyone to pursue if that's something that they can do or if that's something that's of interest but we didn't want to penalize anybody for a lack of formal education because um, when we look around, many of us have education in different areas, but only two out of like 20 of New Mexico United's front office staff have actual sports education experience. So um, we're misfits from a bunch of different industries and, and that's what makes it great. And then I won't go into this too, too much, but I wanted to just show the difference between the coaching fellowship and the front office fellowship. So this is a little bit longer. It's over the full six months and um, it's a little less structured than the front office fellowship because they basically are invited to just every practice, some game bench situations. And then what I thought was really cool, what coach wanted to do was also commit to um, attending, if they were currently coaching, attending sessions of each um, fellow in the program so they could actually see how they were coaching their um, players, whether it was club soccer, whether it was youth, you know, little kickers. There's a lot that you can learn about somebody's coaching philosophy and their coaching style through watching them at work. Um, and again, they get a stipend through the coaching fellowship as well. This is pretty similar. Um, we did want to have somebody with a minimum of three years coaching or technical experience or high level playing experience. Um, so this is a great uh, tie to the conversation that everyone was just having about, you know, the pipeline from player to coach. I think that's a really incredible way to keep great people in the game over a period of time um, and have them develop a career and, and develop skill sets after playing it's it's not like your life is over once you stop playing and we want people to stay connected to the game and to new mexico united for as long as they as they would like to be so that's almost the same as before and this is also almost the same as before i just wanted to include it again if people want copies of this they can literally take the text and just adjust it a little bit and put this out if that's something of interest to them um, I wanted to just show here too for the front office. This is a copy of a, a, a real um, resume and like cover letter overview that somebody did. I blocked out the names, but the things that we were looking for in candidates 
was do they grasp our culture in their cover letter? Um, something that's tough to talk about but is real is that in this first year of the program, we also have to be thinking about the fellows and the candidates, you know, five years from now. And with it being a new program, we did need people to be able to speak to their experience and um, speak to what they were going through through the program because before we even formally launched it, we did have a lot of interest in people watching what we were doing, um, interviewing the fellows, telling stories about them. And it, it was important for us to have someone who could handle that at this point in their lives. So um, as you can see, some people didn't score high on that. Most of the time when they didn't score high on that, they didn't score high in other areas too. Um, and then again, like what we consider to be merit, knowing that this program has a limited capacity to two fellows at a time in the front office and two in coaching. Um, there is a little bit of like, you know, the merit conversation. This one was interesting too, the trajectory. This was tough sometimes too. Like, do we think our program will really help? And that comes into play if somebody's, you know, already really thriving in a career and it doesn't really look like they're trying to make a pivot or are they still in a place in their career where they're not ready to make a next step? Like, what are they going to do with the $2,500? These are things that we were like actually able to ask in interviews to try to get answers or to inform how we were going to score these certain things, the commitment to growth and then the overall quality. So I just figured since I had that, I could share that with you all. So you could see the perspective going into trying to select um, fellows from a very large candidate pool. And then this is my favorite slide. This is who we ended up with. So I'll tell you a little bit about each person. Um, I have the uh, front office fellows on the left and the coaching fellows on the right. So at the top left, we have Leroy Silva, who has been an advocate in our um, community for indigenous representation and growth of individuals in the indigenous community. So he actually works for a nonprofit that um, helps provide um, access to sport to Native youth, and he works with us um, in our game days to actually include them in part of our pregame elements. And so he's a wonderful community leader in some sort of way. We were a little surprised that he wanted to learn from us. So in his interviews, we were asking him like, okay, so we're planning to have a whole day where you work the retail floor. Like, are you sure that this is what you really wanna do? Cause we'll work with you in whatever way you want. If you wanna like build something together, if you wanna be part of the Somos Unidos Foundation. And he was like, no, I really wanna think about, you know, pursuing athletics as more of a core part of my community work. And he sees what the piece of, of athletics and sport and activity in general does for his community and he wants to be able to build on that um, and he's a person that in our in our classroom sessions is taking photos of every slide and taking vigorous notes and it's just very cool to see um, you know he he played basketball growing up so soccer I think uh, as a fan is something that's been part of his life but um, really learning the, the inner workings of a front office system you can tell he's really taking to that um and you know given his schedule and his employment um situation he he can really only attend the classroom sessions and he can do a little bit of the in-person stuff but that's the other thing too is trying to build a skeleton for the program and then letting each person kind of have their own um actual program that they have it is something that we're learning that we kind of have to to work on it as we go too because then as i go to Juliana here in the lower left corner. Um, she has been somebody who's been in love with racing and motorsports her whole life as a spectator and as an athlete herself. And so that has been a really fun thing to explore, you know, the difference between that community and the soccer community. And um, she's currently a beer tender at a local brewery, which is super cool. She's a manager there. But um, that's that's a whole different experience than Leroy's. So her availability is pretty much all day until four o'clock where then she goes and works like four to close. And she has been spending probably two to three days a week in our offices, just attending meetings that are happening. Um, she, so she's been very immersed in more of the shadowing and real-time learning 
um, because her schedule affords her the ability to do that. And she's just kind of the, the person who follows her nose and is really curious and really wants to pursue every part of the business that she can get her hands on. Um, she's already worked a couple of game day type situations, right? Whether it was a preseason or our first home opener, she's been right there by our side, like getting the hands-on experience, which is really cool. And something she said yesterday in our classroom session where we were talking about branding and voice is the difference between New Mexico United's brand and some of the motorsports brands that she's been a you know fidelitous to in the past is that New Mexico United, like she feels like the team and the sport love her back. And sometimes like in motorsports, it feels like it's a one-way love. And so you know, that that was really nice to hear. And that is something that, you know, she's also beginning to see the difference in like the care that we take with our brand and our voice and our customer centric obsession um, is actually coming to life in real terms for her. Then um, as we just move over, we have Taryn Dyke. She's one of our coaching fellows and she's someone who already is in kind of the, the club and coaching network in Albuquerque. You can see in one of her photos, she's wearing her Lobo, which is the University of New Mexico, her Lobo soccer shirt as she was pregnant. Um, she was she was like going into labor. So that's been a part of her story too, is that soccer and coaching has always been part of her life. Um, but she still has goals pursuant to her licensure that she hasn't been able to complete yet. And so um, she's working with us to accomplish that. And she's been a great fellow on the coaching side. And then um, really as a stark difference, we have Paris McKenzie, who um, is a sophomore, I guess now technically going into her junior year at the University of New Mexico and plays on the women's team. Um, and so not seasoned really at all in terms of coaching, but has been playing the game her entire life. She's from England. And I love the idea that Taryn and Paris get to learn the same things at the same time, because I think they're going to have a great mentor mentee relationship. And I think it's actually probably going to be illuminating for Taryn how much learning side by side with Paris uh, probably shows her about, you know, ways that she can evolve her own co coaching philosophy because she's kind of learning it again. Um, and she's able to have like a, a cyclical feedback loop with our coaching staff. So part of what is asked of the coaching fellows is to provide feedback on the New Mexico United first team trainings. So in a way, it's also helping coach Lassane to have his coaching philosophy and strategy challenged from a technical side. So those are our fabulous fellows. Um, if you want to look at our social media, um, actually YouTube would probably be the best place. We did a video for each one of these fellows where you can hear more about them in their own words. They're just such fabulous people. Um, and then I wanted to get to the portion that, you know, and we can take the screen off soon and so we can talk face to face, but um, I wanted to just lead with what I imagine potential challenges are coming up in your mind already and that I agree are challenges. So the top down buy in is something that you absolutely have to have because, like I said earlier, is that these fellows are coming into our space and they're not intended to make anybody's lives any easier. And in a club environment, there's a lot to do and about five less people than needed to do it. So we're already super busy during COVID and during uncertainty about seasons and stadium capacities and all of that. Like everybody's got a very full plate. And so from the coaching side, from Coach Lassane, um, who is actually an original ideator on the program, and then our CEO, Peter Trevisani, they both have to be committed to allowing our team to pursue this and to go to the next point to pursue funding that is basically going to be a pass through. Um, so it's a fundraising attempt that isn't going to get to build the original programs 
and expenses in place. Um, so we are giving each fellow in the inaugural year $2,500. So um, as you know, that's like not enough to get a, a full license unless it's the, I think, D and maybe part of C. So, um, you know, that is something that we also want to grow down the line. But um, funding is tough. So that was, you know, at least a $12,000 line item that we had to figure out how to cover. Maybe New Mexico United specific, but maybe not. Um, we were able to actually find a banner sponsor for the program that covered the stipends and some operational costs as well. And what is a really cool piece of that um, is that part of their sponsorship includes an activation where the fellows are going to um, apply what they've learned in core partnerships to actually conduct and execute uh an entire activation that we wanted to value between five and ten thousand dollars for the partner and so we're still fact finding and learning of what that might be but um it'll be maybe an event maybe a digital activation and what's cool about that is it provides a real learning experience and a practical case study for the fellows and our partner gets additional value from being part of the program and because the partner knows that they're actually investing in the fellows, they're a safe person for them to also, you know, give a pitch to and have an original fact finding meeting. So that was just an incredible idea that our corporate partnerships team had when they were thinking about what they wanted to do in their piece of the pie of educating the fellows. Um, and that leads also to capacity to execute. That is a challenge and you kind of have to get the emergency exit row verbal confirmation that your team is going to support the program in the, its entirety. They have to commit to coming in Monday mornings at 9 a.m. to do their classroom portion, an hour and a half each on a weekly basis. Um, they have to, as I'm sure many people watching have been asked, to coffee or have been asked like can i shadow you for a day like we know that that takes additional time and energy and thought and so i'm very lucky to have a team who didn't hesitate in saying yes and while we all might need reminders of the priority sometimes um they've never let us down in what they were able to provide to the fellows when they're under their care um and then candidate selection i kind of alluded to this earlier uh, we had a really great um, initial response on the front office side. Our coaching side was a little challenging. So what we were learning is that this is a great uh, learning experience for us in that our embedded, like our place in the network of coaching and clubs and stuff was not actually like very diverse. So we learned that we have to have a more grassroots relationship from the coaching side with diverse clubs and with diverse um, places where candidates are gonna come from. So we had to do a little bit more outreach there um, to actually reach diverse candidates. And that is something that now becomes a strategic priority for us moving forward, learning that we weren't getting enough um, candidates in that area without actually inviting people to apply, asking, people for recommendations it, that was not by any means one of those if you build it they will come um, situations so we can talk more about challenges and stuff in q a for sure because i want to hear you know what originally lights up for you is like why this may not be possible um because i want to help and if we can't get to that conversation today you know my door is always open and i would be happy to talk through any of these things with with any of you and then finally, I just wanted to remind that when we were thinking about types of curriculum, we had field, classroom. So field would be they're working the retail floor, they're working a game day, um, they're in a meeting like with corporate partnerships. Classroom is where we actually present to them for an hour and a half on a specific area of the business. One on one is just like a conversation. So we have somebody who does like New Mexico United's TikTok. So that's just like spending some time actually making one together or something like that. And then research in solo. 
Um, that was kind of put in place for if we were in a COVID situation where we could not actually be in person or if we had a lot of schedule constraints that I had every department think about what they could actually like assign as homework if it did come to that. And then what I'll do is just pull this up really quick, the front office schedule, and I just will run through like not even one by one, but basically it starts with NMU 101 where we take them a tour of the locker room of our front office and introduce them to everybody. We do career pathways in the soccer landscape where I actually learned a lot about like the sport in general from the top down, corporate partnerships, ticketing, branding, merchandise, supporters group and fan engagement, that's coming up next. Community impact, sales philosophy, media training, legal contracts and risk. Then we revisit it at one point. And then as you can see here, we actually have them working specific games. And then in the beginning, we had them actually attend opening night. Juliana, our motocross lady, actually did not want to attend, even though we gave her tickets, she wanted to work. So that was super fabulous. And then at the end, just a dinner celebration and you know reflection. So this is also something that anybody can have at any time. So I will stop sh sharing my screen and open it up to when we can actually like talk to each other. And I'm looking at the chat for the first time. So let's see. Oh, Q and A. Yeah, the, the candidate search. So somebody asked, would you please discuss more about your candidate search? How many people applied in the geographic representation? Where did you post the link for the position? How long was the process? So um, we originally had it, th this kind of was something that was covered in the coaching conversation, but um, we learned for sure that we couldn't just put it out in our like immediate network. So our original idea, which was short-sighted, quite honestly, was just to email it to our list, put it up on social, and see what happens. And we got a lot of interest on the front office side, but not on the coaching side. So that is where we had to actually talk to each person of our technical team and say, hey, will you like actually go out into the community and ask for recommendations, be looking at high school coaches, um, be looking at some of our like youth clubs in different areas of our community. Um, so we did have some geographic representation from I would say to give a radius of like an hour away. Um, so getting into some of the more rural areas of New Mexico, but that's definitely an opportunity too for next year is trying to make it more inclusive and accommodating to see, or trying to make many experiences. This is something else that we talked about is like, could somebody actually come into our space on like a Thursday, Friday, work a game day, Saturday, wrap up Sunday, and do a Monday and do like a condensed experience where it's just like more of a boot camp than a fellowship to give people the opportunity to travel in if they are like three hours away and have somewhat of an experience without being with us for the entire time or going um, totally virtual and in, in doing that. So we did have the link out and circulating for longer than we actually wanted to because of that coaching issue we wanted to keep everything open but the links were open for like two months um to apply hi oh bye um and so how does the organization measure the value of the fellowship program um definitely in the feedback we receive at the end and just watching what the fellows do next not putting pressure on their immediate next step but watching them um, for the full year or two years and staying in touch and establishing kind of an alumni class um, so that there can be additional mentorship through the program um, moving forward. So those were the two Q&As, but I am going to take a quick look at the chat. I know we're almost out of time. Um, let's see. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that you, you all um, at least got some value out of, I know it was a very heady and text heavy um, presentation, but I wanted to show you like what we put out there and what some of the insights were into why we did what we did. Um, let's see, any, does anybody else have any other questions? You can just drop them in. Hi, Rach. 
Well, hi, I think you may have covered it. And we are so lucky to have such an in-depth presentation from you. Wow, the work you guys are doing is incredible. One thing that has been a constant in the chat throughout your presentation, everyone got, wants to get their hands on this. So oh, cool. please, we will, we will be sure to share that in our follow-up emails from Chanel. Chanel, if there's a way you would like to be contacted, we let people know you're in the Women in Soccer Network. You can get an email contact via her player card if you go into the community portal. Otherwise, any other ways to connect with you? Yeah, just email me anytime and we can set something up. I just dropped my email in the chat, but if that can be shared, I actually will add it to my presentation before I email it to you. That way it's all in one place. Fantastic. Wow, you guys are doing incredible work. We can't thank you enough from the entire women in soccer team for being here. Just to do a quick synopsis while we let Chanel uh, go back to her day and, and get into her work day. Thanks again thank for you, being everyone. here, Chanel. Um, New Mexico United and the Somos Unidos Foundation doing incredible things, giving folks an awareness of what to expect if you're creating a fellowship program. Make sure you are, are outlined what's required and create an inclusive accommodation that allows for flexibility so people can participate and so many more golden golden nuggets inside of that presentation. Okay, it is breakout time. You will have about, I'm going to say 10 minutes versus the full 15. So that way we move you through over to part two. Keep an eye out for that announcement on when to click on the part two banner and move over to the next segment so you can keep joining us at the fair. But a quick note on who to expect at some of the tables. Tracy Ham will be on floor two at the coaching table. We'll have Tioma Atambo from the Sporting Kansas City at the nutrition table on floor two. Floor one will have Maria Grasso from AT&T at the sponsorship and partnership table. We'll have Megan Sullivan from the NWSL at the finance table. At the marketing and branding table, we will have Maria Mernan. We will have uh, Brittany Gropp at the footballistas table. She'll be there all morning. And on floor two as well, we will have Samantha Khalila, Khalila I'm sorry, Samantha on, on the last name uh, at the USL table and floor two as well, Jake Orr at the US soccer table. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh.